Why is it especially difficult for some patients to find a medicine that, quote, works for them? Uh, as helpful as medication is, uh, medication does not work as well as uh, any of us would like, uh, doctors included. Uh, we know that when it comes to treating mood disorders in general, bipolar disorders in particular, uh, it truly is uh, an individual experiment. Each person, uh, and by the way, this is not all that much different, say, than treating hypertension, for example, uh, or arthritis. Uh, every patient sort of is their own uh, experimental paradigm in which we have a process of trial and error. And when it comes to bipolar disorder, we know that only about 50% of people uh, have a robust and satisfactory response to the first medication that we try them on. So that leaves the other 50% uh, having to go through some additional uh, levels of trials. And that additional 50%, some of them will have to switch to a new medication uh, to give that a try. Others may need more than one medication. As a matter of fact, uh, it is probably close to half the people who have bipolar disorder uh, achieve a satisfactory result, uh, meaning the uh, treatment of both poles of the disease. Uh, and we can talk about the fact that uh, the, the depressed pole is a harder one to treat, but uh, really close to half of the people uh, get a satisfactory result on being on more than one medicine. Uh, sometimes three, sometimes even four uh, medications. I think there was one study that showed about 15% of people with bipolar disorder uh, require four medications uh, to be able to achieve the kind of clinical results that they're looking for. <clears throat> and again, we're, we're not talking about no results uh, with uh, the first medication or fewer than four, but we're just talking about optimal results. So unfortunately, we do not yet have a method to tell in advance uh, which is the best possible choice uh, for patients. We have some leanings. Uh, so, for example, we know what medications tend to be a little bit more effective on the, uh, to prevent the relapse of the depressed side of the illness uh, than others. So, for example, there's uh, really good evidence that lamictal or lamotrigine is probably more effective at preventing the depressed side of the illness. So for those for whom that's the overwhelming pole um, and they're not uh, doing well, that may be a, a better choice than some. Matter of fact, it's uh, one of the few medications that have been approved by the FDA for the treatment of the depressed phase of bipolar disorder. Although we use a lot of things, the official nod from the government actually goes to a few. One of them is Lamotrigine, another one is Seroquel, and another one is this new medication, Latuda, that just got the official nod. Uh, physicians, by the way, are not limited to what's officially approved because there are all sorts of things that may work just the things that have gone through a very, very rigorous vetting process, scientific vetting process, get the official approval. So there's some things that we can say that there are trends about. But really, at this point, we do not have a very reliable way of saying this person would probably you know, we want to choose lithium or this person we'd want to choose Depakote or this person we'd want to choose Tegretol or Lamictal or uh, uh, Latuda, any specific medications. I could go down them all and have the same conclusion. So, and, and again, psychiatry is not that much different than other fields of medicine at the moment. Uh, there's not a lot of data, for example, as to who would respond to which blood pressure medication. Uh, you make a few educated guesses, sometimes response runs in families, um, and you can say, oh, well, my, my mother or my brother responded to this medication, and that suggests a, a genetic uh, sensitivity to the value of that particular medication. So taking an important and a family history is a very important part. 
of any evaluation, not just for diagnostic reasons, but for treatment reasons as well. But other than those kinds of things, we simply can't say with robust confidence uh, medication A is going to work for you. So um, this idea that people may have a difficult time finding a regimen that works for them is a pretty common thing. And I would say that for, for about half of people with bipolar disorder, it really is a process that may take, and you know, hold on to your seats, folks, uh, may take as much as long as two years uh, of some uh, experimentation, some trial and error, uh, to try and optimize the medication regimen. Um, and that's one of the reasons why a good, solid, devoted relationship with a psychiatrist uh, is so important because uh, that therapeutic alliance is the vessel uh, in which this uh, process ferments. And we can, in this way, you know, by creating a, a solid therapeutic relationship, you have a chance, an opportunity, uh, good communication, good feedback, trust on both sides, uh, to go through what may well be a two-year process of, uh, of this trial and error to find the optimum regimen. What does the subjective experience of the patient play in the treatment of psychiatric disorders? Well, uh, it's really interesting because in many ways that question goes to the heart of what it means to have a psychiatric disorder. Um, the fact is that subject, you th think about subjectivity and objectivity. So subjectivity is, you know, the person's inner experience, what it feels like to be you uh, inside. And some of that may be able to be put into words. Some of it cannot be put into words. We'll call the objective experience what others can see on the outside. And I'm going to translate that into words that we use clinically. So the subjective experience, uh, we would call that as clinicians symptoms. Symptom. Symptoms is what the person tells you they're experiencing. The objective, uh, we would call, call that in clinical medicine signs. Signs is what you observe of the other person. So symptoms and signs, subjective and objective. And in all of medicine, uh, the process of coming to a diagnostic conclusion, in other words, answering the question, what's going on here, uh, based on the finite number of w patterns that uh, human beings can uh, malfunction, uh, both physically and mentally, that uh, process relies on both signs and symptoms. And signs, obviously, are the easier of the two for the clinician because we can look at objective behaviors, uh, people talking fast, uh, people not making sense in how they speak, uh, people being agitated and restless and unable to sit still, um, or the objective signs that are reported by family members who might describe what they're seeing. So signs are the easier of the two. Symptoms are the harder of the two because that really relies on the person's own personal testimony. And contra here's uh, something I went back when I was a single person and dating, uh, and uh, the women that I would be dating discovered I was a psychiatrist um, and would get all sheepish and uh, uncomfortable, I would have to give my standard disclaimer, which is uh, contrary to popular belief, we are not mind readers. We cannot read your mind. Uh, and most of what we know about what's going on in your mind is what you tell us. And so in that sense, uh, the patient is the single most important source of information that we use both to come to diagnostic conclusions and treatment planning. Uh, so what you tell us uh, is of tremendous value. What you 
fail to tell us can make a very big impact. Uh, so it's possible uh, in psychiatry uh, for those all-important symptoms, those subjective symptoms, to be hidden. And believe me, nobody has practiced psychiatry for very long before they've uh, encountered plenty of experiences where people have withheld information, um, both about what's going on outside the office and also, more importantly, withholding information about what's going on inside of them. Because uh, it's very easy to either avoid questions or lie. So if I say, are you hearing any voices talking to you that you're not sure that anybody else can hear but you, it's up to you whether you answer me uh, accurately or not. And the answer that you give me, because this is a subjective symptom, can steer me in one or another of some very, very different directions, both, both in my thinking about what's going on here, i.e. diagnosis, or how can I help you, i.e. therapeutics. So I cannot emphasize enough the importance of self-disclosure. And again, we're back to what I consider the key ingredient in psychiatric treatment. Uh, it is uh, the, the ingredient that makes all the rest gel, and that is the treatment relationship. And there are a lot of challenges these days to developing a robust treatment relationship, not the least of which is having enough time uh, to sit with your doctor and repeated encounters with your doctor. But building the alliance, building the connection between doctor and patient is critical in the way that, let's say, in surgery, having a sterile field is critical, right? You can do surgery without a sterile field, but things are probably going to get messed up or you're not going to really have the best outcomes. Sterile field really enables surgery to be its best and do its best. A treatment alliance between a psychiatrist and a patient, any mental health professional and a patient, this isn't limited just to the MD psychiatrist, uh, the treatment alliance is the sterile field uh, without which things can go pretty awry. And so, you know, for those who are listening, I invite you all to think about this. I invite you to reflect on the degree to which you feel in a trusting and comfortable alliance. And I think if you're not feeling uh, confident in that, uh, it is quite important for you to bring that up uh, in your sessions and to talk about those feelings. I get a lot of uh, opportunity to do second opinion consultations. Uh, so people who are seeing other psychiatrists will come and consult me. Oftentimes what they're doing is they're coming and wanting to switch uh, psychiatrists. And I actually have a policy that I do not take on any patient who already has a psychiatrist. I'm a scarce resource, and I like to make myself for ongoing treatment available to those who aren't already in a treatment relationship with a psychiatrist. So very often when they're coming to me and I'm kind of going over how I can optimize, help them as a second opinion, optimize their treatment with their current psychiatrist, what I very commonly find is not that the current uh, Treatment is, involves a misdiagnosis or um, that the current psychiatrist isn't uh, practicing, you know, really state-of-the-art psychopharmacology. I don't necessarily have any grand new ideas sometimes for uh, medications or other kinds of therapies. Very often what I'm discovering is the problem as to why the treatment isn't going well is there's a problem with the treatment alliance between the doctor and patient. And that's what I end up focusing on in the course of the consultation. And 
end up you know, contacting the treating psychiatrist or writing a report that really emphasizes that this is the issue and this is the issue that needs to be worked on. And sometimes what I can do in this kind of consultation is to help open the patient up to that problem and open up to some ways of beginning to talk about that with their doctor and try on some approaches for size and kind of walk them through it and rehearse how that would be done and also to be in an advocacy position where I get to talk to their doctor uh, about my ideas and concerns about the treatment alliance and how that could be made better. So I think all of that really stems from the original question, which is what is the importance of subjectivity and the self-disclosure that is so critical, such a foundation on which any attempt to heal problems in mental life must be based. Are the pills worth taking? That's a very open-ended question, the pills worth taking. So uh, let me kind of reframe that in a little bit more structured way. And I would say that um, here's another concept that we often talk about and it's written about, and, and that is the uh, balance between uh, risks and benefits, costs and benefits, uh, or uh, side effects and therapeutic effects. Um, I can't remember what famous wit said this, but one of them did, said, there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs in life. Uh, and I think that's true in almost every domain in which we endeavor. Uh, and I sometimes you know, deal with that when doing psychotherapy with patients which I do in addition to psychopharmacology. But it's true with medications. There are no solutions, there are only trade-offs, or um, there's no free lunch. You know, uh, one of the uh, ancient languages of medicine is Latin. And I remember in medical school learning the Latin version of there's no free lunch. Illum nullum prendium. Illum nullum prendium, you know. We doctors like to use Latin and Greek. So there's no free lunch. And everything has a cost or a risk to it. And indeed, you know, one of the things that's the art of medicine uh, is thinking through that delicate balance of cost, the cost-benefit ratio or the risk-benefit ratio. What's the downside and what's the upside? You know, the surgeon sometimes has to amputate the limb to save the life. It's a very dramatic example. We may have some similar dramatic examples in psychiatry. Much or many are more subtle than that. But in our contemporary time, when we so endeavor to embrace the autonomy of patients uh, rather than paternalistically just push stuff on them, uh, this calculation, this assessment of the delicate balance between uh, risks and benefits is a dialogue, a conversation between doctor and patient. And uh, the doctor, you know, ought to lay out here are the risks and here are the benefits. I will tell you that, you know, that is something that is going to be a different calculus for every person. So one of the things that I often think about when, when going through this with patients is not just what are the risks and benefits of starting medications or trying certain medications, um, but also what are the risks and benefits of stopping medications. Very often people who are doing well uh, ask me, okay, so I'm really doing well. By the way, I love it when they ask me rather than just do it on their own uh, and be their own doctor and decide on their own to stop their medicine. So I, I really welcome people to engage me in the dialogue so I can educate them. And we'll talk there about the risks and the benefits of stopping medications. 
And when I'm in that conversation, and I, I bring that up to just illuminate this question, uh, I c- kind of tend to think of people as being in, in two different categories. So some people that I'm treating uh, have had a history of an illness uh, in which they have had profoundly life-disrupting or dangerous, life-threatening symptoms. Uh, maybe on the depressed side, that would be uh, suicidal uh, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. On the manic side, it could be uh, you know, draining their entire family fortune or getting into legal difficulties due to manic behaviors and, and all sorts of other examples. And then I have the category of folks for whom uh, I would say the worst thing that they experienced was discomfort, discomfort as opposed to danger, the two Ds, discomfort and danger. And I separate in my mind those two categories because I think about the risks and the benefits of stopping medication differently for those two categories. Obviously, the risks are huge in people in the dangerous history category and much less in the risks of the discomfort category. So I'll tell the, I'll, I'll tell the people who are in the discomfort category, okay, look, if we stop the medications, your risk is the risk of discomfort. And I generally step much further back with those patients for whom the greatest risk is simply discomfort. And, you know, say, look, you know, it, this, is, this really is a very personal decision as to just how much discomfort you're willing to risk. Um, whereas those for whom they're in the category of danger, dangerous history, I don't step so far back. I take a, a much more strong advisory role, uh, a much uh, more uh, paternalistic um, role. Obviously, you know, there's only so far I can do to chase patients home and make them take their medicines, but um, we'll be very, very strongly opinionated in those situations that I think that's a, a really, really unacceptable risk and urge them uh, more to stay on their medications. So, that just gives you an example of how we th- can think differently in different circumstances about this balance between the risks and the benefits. Why do I take medications for epilepsy when I'm not epileptic? You know, these categories of, <laughs> of medications uh, that med- medications fall into, like anti-epileptics or antipsychotics or antihypertensives, um, those categories, those names, labels, really are historical. And they refer to the area in which the a medication, when it first came out, was used. And what often ends up happening is that uh, as we advance uh, over the years, over the decades, we come to recognize that some of the um, pharmacological effects that a medication has that help one kind of condition turn out to be of value to another kind of condition. So just sticking to my own field here, psychiatry, uh, we have come over the years to recognize that medications in a variety of other categories have uh, effects uh, on the brain. And by the way, there are categories that originally had nothing to do with the brain. So for example, calcium channel blockers like verapamil, which is in the uh, category of calcium channel blockers and was originally developed for treating blood pressure. Uh, We now uh, find that in fact, that has some uh, neurological effects in the brain and that it can be uh, used in mood disorders. An- another uh, uh, medication that was came from the world of high blood pressure, guanfacine. Uh, guanf- 
cyclophosphine was one of the earliest antihypertensives for blood pressure. We have since come to discover that it has uh, neuroactive effects in the brain, uh, not just on the blood vessels in the body for blood pressure, but in the brain. And we now uh, use that for the treatment of attention deficit disorder, guanfacine. Well, similarly, and perhaps not uh, even so remarkably, uh, other medications that have an effect on the brain uh, sometimes can be of value uh, for treating psychiatric disorders. So historically, medications that were originally uh, invented and marketed and used for epilepsy uh, turn out to actually have neuropharmacological effects that are of value for mood disorders. Some of them, not all of them. So-called anti-epileptics, some of them that probably many of the listeners are on, Depakote uh, or valproic acid, uh, Lamictal or Lamotrigine, Tegretol or Carbamazepine, Trileptal or Oxcarbamazepine. Um, there's been some literature, it turns out it didn't flesh out as well as we liked, with uh, Neurontin or Gabapentin. Uh, Lyrica uh, actually has some uh, uh, very significant value in mood disorders, especially those uh, mood disorders that are associated with chronic pain syndromes. Uh, paragabalin, so that's uh, another anti so-called anticonvulsant. Now, these things are all still being used by neurologists to treat epilepsy. You know, it's interesting, it goes the other way, too, that our medications uh, often have found use in psychiatry, started in psychiatry, have found uses in other areas of medicine. A uh, classic example is Thorazine, good old Thorazine, the first of its kind, uh, uh, chlorpromazine is the generic name. Uh, it was long ago discovered that Thorazine uh, had a powerful anti-nausea effect. It was actually uh, before we had more modern things like Odansetron um, that uh, Thorazine was a very, very useful anti-emetic for treating nausea, especially in cancer patients uh, at fairly low doses. It's one excellent example. Uh, by the way, uh, thinking about history, um, the very first category of uh, antidepressants, even before the old tricyclic antidepressants, were the MAOI inhibitors, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. That's that category of medicine you have to be on a special diet for. You have to be careful which medications you mix with them. Those actually started off as uh, drugs to treat tuberculosis uh, back in the early 20th century, uh, and then to treat blood pressure. Uh, so long before they found their way into psychiatry, and the way they found their way into psychiatry is that when they were given for people for tuberculosis, uh, we discovered that a lot of those old-fashioned uh, patients, you don't know, see too much tuberculosis anymore, except in certain pockets of the inner city, but used to be much more common in the 19th century. The people with tuberculosis and depression, their depression got better. Lo and behold, what's going on here? That actually was the dawn of the modern era of psychopharmacology. The very first antidepressants were kind of a serendipitous discovery about what happened with uh, when you gave tuberculosis patients for their tuberculosis MAOI uh, medication. So don't get stuck on the uh, category names. They are archaic. They're somewhat historical. And, and unfortunately, uh, because of that, I think it leads to confusion uh, on the part of patients in particular who are scratching their head. Um, you know, an another thing that I, I often have to deal with with patients is the idea that the so-called antipsychotics is another uh, old name 
historically based, and especially the so-called atypical antipsychotics, are being used now to treat depression and bipolar disorder, even if you are not necessarily suffering from psychotic symptoms. So the utilization of medications like Seroquel and Zyprexa and Abilify and Geodon, to give some examples of the so-called atypical, quote, antipsychotics, unquote, Many people, you know, I put them on this medication, then they go home and they start reading and they say antipsychotic and they come in and say, Doc, do you think I'm psychotic? Or, gee, this is a medication that was marketed for schizophrenia. Uh, I thought you said I, I, I'm, I have a mood disorder, a bipolar disorder. You're treating me for schizophrenia. No, no, sorry you have that impression. But, in fact, uh, we're talking about labels and categories and then I have to go through the whole explanation that I just gave, uh, turns out that these medications originally developed for schizophrenia can have very significant mood stabilizing and antidepressant properties. So at the end of the day, being a practicing clinician is about, is being a pragmatist. Uh, and that is not being confined to you're thinking based on labels, but doing what works, trying to figure out what works. And, you know, you need to have some scientific basis for doing that. You need to have not just a theoretical basis, but even more importantly, it's nice to see reports in the literature of people who have responded to certain medications for certain conditions and case series of trying it out so that, you know, it's a little tough to be the very first on the block and uh, you don't want to just throw spaghetti at the wall. But uh, the art of clinical psychiatry is a very, very pragmatic combination of art, art and science. Is it true that brain damage occurs during and or after each serious manic depressive episode? Well, um, we cannot document, um, it, we do not have the tools at this point to document specific damage that you can see structurally uh, after each manic or depressive episode. But we do know a few interesting things. One is people who have had many, many episodes, we can document certain changes in both the structure of the brain, such as the size of an inner region of the brain called the hippocampus, as well as the function of the brain as looked at uh, by both testing of the brain functions, paper and pencil testing, as well as some uh, active testing of blood flow patterns and so forth. But one episode at a time, you know, we're not going to be able to show, you know, after the last episode you have, here's the evidence that there is damage. What we do have, though, is uh, a, a, some, a clinical phenomenon that does suggest that something is changing in the brain with each subsequent episode. And that phenomenon is that, with bipolar disorder in particular, that the more episodes you have, the more the pattern of the illness changes, changes in a variety of ways, that each subsequent episode will come faster and faster will be more and more severe, will be, uh, the fire will be less easily quenched uh, by medication and what might be uh, treatable with one medication after the first episode uh, may require, you know, three or four me medications by the fifth episode. So there's an acceleration of the illness um, and we actually have a term for that um, in the literature, in science, 
uh, and it's called kindling, and kind of like a fire, kindling a fire, which, you know, when it first starts, little twigs and so forth, it's uh, very easy to put out. But the more it burns, the harder it is to put out. You know, what may start off as a little smoldering piece on the carpet, the more it burns, pretty soon the drapes catch fire and the wall catches fire, and then, you know, uh, the whole fire department uh, is needed to put the thing out. So what I'm describing is actually the course of untreated bipolar disorder, the natural history, just let it roll. No interventions, no treatments. And by the way, just then as an aside, the, <laughs> the average length of time that it takes the typical person to get the diagnosis right or even be evaluated <laughs> for uh, bipolar disorder, the average length of time is 10 years. So by 10 years, most people have had more than one episode, and so kindling has already begun. And we can talk about, you know, why does it take 10 years? And it, it's not that it takes 10 years for a psychiatrist to reach the conclusion. It may take 10 years for a person to agree to voluntarily or involuntarily see a psychiatrist for the first time. It may take 10 years to get to that point, and that is actually, you know, very core point of the book that I wrote called You Need Help, a step-by-step -step guide to convince a loved one to get counseling uh, to try and shorten that kind of 10-year lag uh, in helping the people who are troubled in your life. But in any event, we're talking about uh, kindling and untreated bipolar disorder. Um, so here is the good news. The good news is that treatment for bipolar disorder doesn't just quench the current episode, has the potential to quench the current episode, whether it's a depressed episode, a manic episode, a mixed episode. It also has prevention value, that it can actually prevent or significantly soften course of the disease over the years to come. So it can actually prevent or minimize kindling. And that is the single most important reason why we ask people to stay on their medications even when they're well. And I know it's so strange to think about staying on a medication when you're well. Of course, people with uh, high blood pressure do it all the time. People with uh, coronary artery disease or elevated cholesterol, you know, take their Lipitor all the time, even though they feel well. So psychiatry has nothing to apologize for in asking people to uh, respect the preventative value of medication uh, in uh, trying to abort the ravages of a chronic condition and to prevent problems. So if you stay on your medication, uh, you will prevent kindling or minimize it. And so the course of the rest of your life can be changed, without which this thing will kindle up and kindle up. And before you know, you'll have 10, 12, 14, 20 episodes each one, you know, maybe the early episodes will be more characterized by distress and the kindled up episodes later on will get to the point of danger and you'll be in that other category of the two categories I described earlier. Uh, you know, every doctor's dream is prevent preventative medicine, uh, something that we dream about a lot more than we're able to practice. Uh, partly due to the limitations of our methods, partly due to patients' unwillingness to uh, engage in preventative health me measures themselves. But continuing on your lithium or your Depakote or your Lamictal uh, or your Seroquel over the course of many, many years is the same as being on Lipitor. Uh, it's 
going to very significantly reduce the ravages of this particular illness for years to come. And that's why when you're feeling better, then the real challenge to you begins because that's when it becomes the most challenging, yet perhaps the most important, to keep the medication going. Is it okay to be a bit eccentric? <laughs> well, my personal opinion, uh, it's preferable to be a bit eccentric. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, eccentricity makes the world go round. Uh, some of the greatest movers and shakers and thinkers and creators in, in history have, uh, have been eccentric. Um, it's for my colleague, uh, Kay Jamison, who many of you are probably familiar with. She's the great uh, researcher of bipolar disorder uh, on the faculty with me at Hopkins. She's written so many books, including the definitive textbook on manic depressive illness, along with uh, Fred Goodwin, and, of course, her very famous work about artists and poets, creativity, uh, in association with uh, mood disorder, and also her famous uh, autobiography of what turns out to be her bipolar disorder, um, which is An Unquiet Mind. Uh, she also wrote another wonderful book. She has many books. Uh, and it's called Exuberance. Exuberance. Uh, and there she explores the fine line the interesting line between illness and eccentricity, uh, between hypomania, mania, and um, exuberance, as the title of the book goes. Uh, another wonderful book that explores this uh, distinction is uh, by my friend John Gartner called The Hypomanic Edge. The subtitle is How a Little Bit of craziness has led to a lot of success in America. Uh, it starts with Christopher Columbus and goes through John Paul Getty all the way up to some of the modern dot-com entrepreneurial uh, uh, venture capitalists, uh, many of whom walk that edge between eccentricity, exuberance, and a clinically significant problematic condition. So what are some of the key features that separate those two domains? And I, I think that uh, one of the core things to look at, which I think is very, very uh, uh, essential to all psychiatric diagnosis, is the idea of dysfunction problems functioning. If you look in our diagnostic uh, manual that has all the criteria for all the different conditions, the DSM, most lately five, every time a new edition comes out, everybody goes wild, the press goes wild, and especially accuses psychiatry of imperializing all of uh, human mental life and calling everything a condition, uh, which is really a tremendous exaggeration, most unfortunate. But so what is a condition? Where do we? What is a disorder? The DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So, what's the threshold for using the word disorder? The threshold is dysfunction. A disorder is manifested by a dysfunction, and every one of those criteria, it says there's something in there about and the person is unable to function in school or work or family in some one or more context in which we human beings are asked to function in our daily lives. So impairment in the ability to function is part of the criteria of every single condition there. It's very interesting. So you might say, uh, let's say, for example, with... Uh, a psychotic illness, you know, uh, hears voices talking to them. Uh, but if you're going to follow the manual, if hearing voices uh, does not in any way 
interfere with your ability to work, to be in relationships, to take care of responsibilities, to function. Uh, you actually cannot officially uh, uh, designate that as a psychiatric condition, even though someone's hearing voices. Um, and indeed, there are uh, a very interesting subset of population uh, who are very high-functioning people who have auditory hallucinations and have had them their whole lives, uh, but no one would know, and they function indistinguishably from sometimes even better than the average person. One comes to mind is uh, the famous actor having a mental block played Hannibal Lecter uh, in uh, Silence of the Lambs. Um, his name will come to me in a second, but you all know who I mean. Uh, he has written often in, in interviews, talked about how his whole life he's heard voices. But uh, sure does function well in uh, both love and work, those two great domains that Sigmund Freud first said human beings have to function, love and work, especially if you expand love to include you know, friendships and being connected to community and so forth. So the inability to function is something that's a very important criteria that designates we are now in the domain of clinical problems. And really, it's dysfunction and extreme suffering, one or both, that causes someone to knock on a doctor's door and say, please help me. Or the really uh, uh, out there may cause their family to knock on the doctor's door and say, please help us help him or help her. Uh, dysfunction as well as extreme distress. Is there a particular approach to weight loss that addresses weight gain as a medication side effect? Right, so medication-induced weight gain uh, in our contemporary American society is, of course, uh, everyone's uh, favorite side effect to hate. Uh, for obvious reasons, women more than men, but men certainly are included in that concern. Um, it's very interesting because I think that I, I've seen the concern about that grow since I first went into psychiatry 25 years ago. It was a concern 25 years ago, but it was not the f utterly front burner concern than it is now. And it's ironic because in the 25 years that I've been a psychiatrist, uh, the weight gaining effects of medication have actually improved uh, over the course of those years. So even though we've made a lot of progress on it, uh, my patients are far more concerned about that now than they were 25 years ago. And I think that may say something about our culture. Because uh, it doesn't say about the meds, because the meds are only getting better. And as a matter of fact, as each new medication comes out, um, we have so... Uh, made so much progress in the weight gain domain with the newer medications that we have that it's almost, you can't get a new medicine to market these days if it causes significant weight gain uh, because that, that that's already been done. So if you're going to compete with what's out there, that the competition is already has that one in the back. Now, that being said, of course, unfortunately, as we talked about it with the first question, not every person responds to every medication. And sometimes it's necessary to use a medication that does indeed cause weight gain as a side effect. So, and I think that when you begin to get into that situation, and obviously, you've got to keep an eye on things because sometimes weight gain involves other developments as well, uh, the development of glucose intolerance, the development of elevated lipids like cholesterol and triglycerides. Uh, all of this is known collectively as the metabolic syndrome. And some of the earlier atypical antipsychotics, there's that crude category term again, like Zyprexa and Risperdal and Clozapine uh, have very significant uh, risk for causing weight gain, whereas the more recent ones like Abilify and Giada 
Babylon and Sepphoris and Latuda, those have kind of conquered the weight gain issue, just like some of the recent antidepressants uh, have conquered the weight gain issue. But again, occasionally we need to go take a step back and use an older medication because the newer ones aren't working. So then it becomes uh, a challenge. And the challenge, first and foremost, really lies in the hands of the patient. Because sometimes, you know, you may end up hitting a home run uh, in terms of psychiatric symptoms with the medication, but it's causing you to gain weight. And then uh, you are faced with the challenge that every human being who is struggling with weight faces, which is how to reverse that or to keep it from happening. And uh, as we see the American population growing heavier and heavier, we see that this is hard. This is very, very hard, harder for some than for others, probably for genetic reasons. The problem is, of course, is that if you are suffering from a psychiatric disorder, what is hard for someone who doesn't have a psychiatric illness might be doubly hard for you. The motivation to exercise, the ability to deploy the self-control that's needed for diet, um, being part of a group process, which is oftentimes, you know, a much easier way to create behavioral changes. Twelve-step programs have shown us uh, for a long time, but being in Weight Watchers or being in an exercise group, uh, working with another human being like a personal trainer, those kinds of things can often really accelerate the uh, the accomplishments of weight gain. Those things do tend to be harder for people who have psychiatric disorders. So there's, you know, an additional thing that we can do to help maybe take the edge off if we're unable to transfer to uh, another medication. Uh, but let me just stop at, with, with, with on that point, transferring to another medication. If you are on a medication that is really working for you, but it's causing you to gain weight, you know, the obvious thing is, well, what about a different one? And again, these days, we do tend to start with the meds that are less likely to cause weight gain, um, like Lamictal, but may have to find our way back to something that is likely to cause weight gain, like lithium. So chances are that you've probably already tried and didn't have success with the medication that's causing your weight gain. Uh, that, I'm sorry, medication that didn't cause weight gain. So now you're on one that does. So what you're looking at is giving up the therapeutic value uh, by continuing to fish around uh, for medicines perhaps you've even already tried that aren't working. Uh, un, uh, inelegantly, uh, I've actually had uh, a handful of patients who have used with me the very inelegant phrase, uh, I'd rather f be fat and happy uh, than skinny and depressed or shredding my life for mania. Uh, obviously, that's an individual decision. So I was going to say there's a third thing that we can do, and there are some medications that we can give that can be helpful. They're not magic pills for gaining weight, but they can make it a little bit easier for the other efforts that you deploy like diet, like exercise, to work. One example is uh, Topamax, or Topiramate, is a medication that has some mild mood-stabilizing properties. Actually, it's an anticonvulsant, uh, and we sometimes do use it for mood stabilization. It's not one of our first-line robust choices. But if you have bipolar disorder, something that has some mood-stabilizing properties, might you know be an additional bonus, but it decreases appetite. It can significantly decrease appetite. But remember, 
illum nullum prandium, no free lunch, pun intended in this case. Um, Topamax has side effects, and one of those side effects is cognitive side effects. It can make your thinking a little bit fuzzy. It's a dose-dependent side effect. The higher the dose, the bigger that side effect, but so is the appetite suppression. It's also a dose-dependent side effect. There's no free lunch. But that gives you an example of something I've used it, and, and I've used it uh, to advantage with, uh, with patients, and it you know, adds an extra edge of value to their efforts. Uh, again, there is nothing that we can prescribe that will just melt the pounds away, and all of those weight loss efforts are going to require you working hard might be actually one of the hardest things you have to do for your illness. Uh, in a way, taking medication takes about uh, you know eight seconds with a cup of water. Uh, it's actually the least demanding part of the treatment of bipolar disorder. Dealing with side effects like this may be the most demanding part. How does a psychiatrist think through problems that people come in with? Well, one of the things that we have unfortunately uh, heard a lot, I hear a lot out there in the world, I do a lot of work on the radio, had my own radio show for many years, uh, this idea of a diagnosis for some people is kind of a dirty word, diagnosis, it's labeling, it's stigmatizing. And in point of fact, uh, it, you know, words become buzzwords and kind of have to keep changing them to stay ahead of the stigma. It's how we got from manic depression to bipolar disorder because manic depression became too stigmatized, even though KJ, K. Jamison still likes it as a noble, poetic, archaic word, term. So diagnosis has kind of become a, a stigmatized word. But in fact, you know, the venerable 2,500-year history of medicine uh, really is a history of trying to sort through systematically, as I said earlier, the, the standard and finite ways that human beings can, can go off wire uh, in their ways in which we function physically and, and mentally. And so, yes, everybody's an individual, and everybody's unique. Uh, and everybody has their own little twist on, on how things go off wire. But at the same time, there are only so many wires that you can go off on. And being able to articulate the pattern of how things are going off wire and recognizing that that pattern has been seen and has been observed and has been studied and that interventions for that pattern have been studied in a systematic and scientific way. That's a very, very powerful set of ideas. And in psychiatry, just like in any other field of medicine, we like to explore that pattern. And that pattern is fleshed out with a longitudinal point of view and a cross-sectional point of view. The longitudinal point of view is called history, t telling the story of how it unfolded over time. And the symptoms and the signs, remember those two terms, that we uh, discussed earlier, how those have unfolded over the course of time, the history. And then the cross-sectional point of view, which is what's happening right here, right now, right in front of you, is the examination. And just like in uh, a primary care doc's office, you know, you tell the story, it started like this, and then the rash spread here, and started to itch, and so forth, and then the doctor does an examination, puts the stethoscope on you and looks at your limbs and in your eyes. We do an examination cross-sectionally. It's called the mental status exam. We're observing. We may ask some very specific questions, probing questions about what's in front of us right now. So we put together the longitudinal history 
and the cross-sectional examination. By the way, that history, especially in psychiatry, is very, uh, sometimes really requires other informants, other maybe members of the family or medical records of past hospitalizations to really give the fullest, most robust picture. Uh, I personally feel that uh, uh, for me to make an accurate conclusion about what's going on here, diagnosis, which one of the standard ways things can go off wire, really takes about two hours. Uh, so my initial evaluations are usually two, two and a half hours to gather all of this information, sit with the person. I often tell them to bring somebody with them to uh, give this additional history. And then uh, I can begin to perceive patterns. Now, in psychiatry, there are a number of different kinds of perspectives that we have because the ways in which human beings suffer do not all boil down to a broken part in the brain, whether that broken part is a neurochemical imbalance, genetic problem, biological basis. Not all of the problems that we have are really best construed as diseases. Bipolar disorder happens to be one of those that probably really is best construed as a broken part. Probably many different broken parts we're trying to flesh out. Uh, it's a whole other uh, interview about the, what do we know about the neurobiology of bipolar disorder. It is a disease. Not every problem, though, is. So, for example, uh, there are conditions that really are not about the broken part. They're not so much what you have. They're about a little more about who you are. You know, we vary uh, along a spectrum. Some of us are taller and some of us are shorter. Some of us are uh, more intelligent. Some of us are less intelligent. Some of us are more vulnerable to rejection and others of us less vulnerable to rejection at all points in between. And sometimes if your traits are way out there at the end of the bell curve, because doesn't mean you have a disease any more than being short is a disease, or being tall is a disease, but being very, very sensitive to rejection is not a disease, but it can get you into a lot of trouble and cause you a lot of suffering and cause you a lot of dysfunction. So sometimes we see things that are much more about traits uh, that might encompass the concept of personality disorders. Then there are other conditions that have to do with what we've learned how we've been sculpted uh, by our experience or reinforced by our environment. Other conditions that may have to do as much with uh, how, what, what were the messages and experiences we had in the course of our developmental years. So why somebody, for example, might have difficulty making commitments or being in, in a committed relationship. It's not a disease. It's not fruitful to be looking for the neurochemistry of that, but it is very fruitful when you can make the link to the fact that your uh, alcoholic parent, you know, abandons you at age eight. Uh, that was uh, the category of conditions that S Sigmund Freud was the first to think closely about, how the story of a person's life might actually lead to psychological problems in adulthood. So in psychiatry, we have all of these different perspectives, and they're not simply a disease. Now, giving that overview, I want to say something very specific about bipolar disorder, which is a disease or a set of diseases, because there are many different kind of flavors of bipolar disorder. There's the type 1 with classic depression and mania, the type 2 with little hypomanias and big depressions, the mixed states, the rapid cycling states. And probably the biology of these things are related, but each uh, somewhat different. So it probably is a family of diseases, if you will. But one of the, the thinking through this, it's very difficult, is that there's a whole other mood disorder called unipolar depression, where people never get the manic or hypomanic side. And it turns out that the treatment for unipolar depression is somewhat different 
than bipolar depression. And in fact, if the depressed episode you're having is part of a bipolar condition, it's possible that treating it as if it were unipolar could actually make it worse, can actually increase cycling. So it's important to tell the difference, but you can't always. So imagine a first episode. So first episode of depression. Is this a unipolar depression or a bipolar depression? Certainly when you're in the depressed phase of bipolar, you can't tell the difference. Only time will tell. Only time will tell. Because if you go on and have another episode, and this time it's hypomanic, and it can be brief, it can be kind of short, it can be lost in the noise, then you've declared the, the, yourself as having a bipolar condition. So, as I said before, since it takes about 10 years on average to come to a psychiatrist's office, or at least to get the diagnosis fleshed out, that's where this idea of history comes in. And history can, if you look closely, a good psychiatric evaluation will, will probe carefully in the years leading up to this, do you see evidence of the upside of the hypomanic or manic side uh, that's lurking and maybe had been overlooked, even if there had been treatment before? Uh, and it's not at all unusual when I evaluate people who have had treatment-resistant depression, they're not getting any better from their depression, and I really probe and I take a careful history, I can uncover that, in fact, this is a bipolar 2 disorder, you know, little tiny hypomanias mixed in there with the deeper depressions, which changes the whole diagnosis and changes the treatment plan. And so that gives you some, uh, I hope, valuable information, not only about how we psychiatrists approach problems in mental life in general, but some specific bugaboos in thinking through the diagnosis of mood disorders in general, bipolar disorder in particular. What is a promising new area of research into further understanding bipolar disorder? Uh, there are some very exciting developments on the horizon. Right now, the gold standard in all of psychiatry for all illnesses about how to make a diagnosis is a trained clinician taking a careful history and doing a careful examination. That's the gold standard. When you want to study 100 people with bipolar disorder, maybe to try medication on them, you'll designate a trained psychiatrist to say, interview these people and tell me yay or nay that they have bipolar disorder. And the doctor says, yes, this is a case, this is a case, this is a case. That's the gold standard for our cases. Put those people in, over, over here in this study, that's bipolar disorder. So other fields of medicine have been lucky enough to develop an additional domain of validation other than the doctor listening to the story and examining the person and watching them um, to make a diagnosis. So, for example, you come into the emergency room with chest pain, going up your arm and shortness of breath. The old days, the doctor would have to say, hmm, I think this person's having a heart attack. Um, and you'd have your diagnosis. But then they developed other domains of validation, an EKG, and you look for characteristic abnormalities, blood tests, looking for certain enzymes, uh, that uh, the heart puts out when it's damaged. And now those are those trump the clinician's uh, history and physical. So if a doctor can say, I think this person's having a heart attack, and do the EKG and get the blood tests, and they're normal, and the doctor has to conclude, I was wrong. They're not having a heart attack. Uh, it's a acid reflux or something else musculoskeletal problem, but it's not a myocardial infarction. Well, we in psychiatry are heartily in search of having those other domains of validation. And the areas that are being looked at uh, are primarily uh, two. One is neuroimaging, and that's a very expensive area. Are there characteristic 
structural and functional findings on some of these sophisticated pictures you can take of the brain with functional MRI and uh, computerized EEGs and um, PET scans, all, all of which are cumbersome and extremely expensive, that can say more definitively than just the psychiatrist's examination, yes, this is a case of bipolar disorder. turns out we're not there yet. There are some promising things on the horizon. Unfortunately, there are some scrupulous, uh, at least one of them very famous practitioner who uh, has grossly oversold the fact that we're there and charges patients thousands and thousands of dollars to go into his machines and get their imaging studies and you can throw them up on the 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 wall and say oh look see because of what i see here in this picture you have a bipolar disorder no i'm sorry we're not ready for that maybe someday certainly not ready to be charging patients eight thousand bucks uh, to have the test so without naming names you've heard my description uh, be an educated consumer and beware but we're, we're headed there. We've now developed some incredible, incredible research, very complicated, very sophisticated to arrive at this point, uh, that looks at uh, the blood, blood test, uh, and looking specifically for RNA that is expressed in elevated manic states and RNAs that are expressed in low depressed states uh, that seem to be pretty highly correlated with being in one of those states. Uh, and this is a very, very uh, exciting and tantalizing prospect. I mean, it's, it's really the first step in a series of uh, steps that are going to be necessary of moving towards a blood test that will be able to show that you have bipolar disorder that can, at the very least, complement the clinician's interview conclusion, which is now the gold standard, but possibly even one day trump the clinician's interview, the way in which the EKG and cardiac enzymes trump the clinician's interview in the diagnosis of a MI, myocardial infarction or heart attack. So that's, those are the directions that we're headed in this, and very promising things on the horizon. They're not ready for prime time yet, but I hope that they will deploy in my own lifetime.